Let's do this. Welcome to the party, security. Yeah. Let's talk about a DevOps view of an AppSec world. So I am a DevOps. I am not application security. So I am going to give you my view of your practice. All right. So let's, uh, let's get this going. First of all, the presentation overview. I want you to know where I'm coming from. So I want to spend a little bit of time explaining me. All right. Because I am going to stand here and I am going to insult you. Just saying. I'm going to spend, I'm going to spend about uh, 15 minutes or so laying out the evolution of DevOps over about 10 years. Okay? I want you to see the history so that you don't have to repeat it. Okay? Remember that wisdom is learning from others' mistakes. Be wise, not smart. Okay, and some ground rules. You may laugh at me, please. Okay? You may interrupt me, please. Just let me defer you if, uh, something, if I can keep the flow of the thing going, like if I'm going to get to whatever's coming later. Okay? Um, Laugh at yourselves, please. I am going to make fun of you because I am also laughing at you. All right. I am a recovering sysop DBA. I was that angry guy. No, dude, the database isn't slow. Your code sucks. <laughs> Don't touch my production. <laughs> that will not perform. Couch DB. Oh. Um, that's not secure. And don't move my cheese, right? <laughs> you know, come on. All right. And honestly, the meme for this is the bastard operator from hell. If you are not aware of the bastard operator from hell, take a quick picture, go look at it, and laugh at yourself. You are the bastard operator from hell today. You know, hey, did you plug it in? Did you try rebooting it? Did your parents have any children that lived? Um, oh, hey, uh, there we go. And. I want you to reflect for just a moment. Are you one of those people that runs down the hall saying, you're breaking all the security, stop! <laughs> yeah, you know you are. <laughs> all right, so a bit of street cred about me. In 2008, I may or may not have had all of the registered teachers in Texas's social security numbers in my possession. Um, I may or may not have responsibly disclosed that. I may or may not have um, caused somebody to go running through the halls of TEA to unplug that server. And um, it may have been one of the largest breaches in 2008 at the time because it was over a million personal identities. Um, my wife and I are certified teachers. <laughs> so uh, I was motivated, if that actually happened. All right, today I am actually a certified DBA. I was a PHP engineer, but isn't that kind of oxymoronic? <laughs> I'm a DevOps engineer, but what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> um, I am a DevOps Days, Austin DevOps, Container Days organizer. I was actually one of the founders of Container Days. So all the Container Days in the world, the first one here was actually, the first one ever was actually in Austin. And Andrew Phillips and I pulled that off together. It was really fun. Did you know there's going to be a DevSecOps Days? December 16th. I don't have links, I'm sorry. Look it up. Uh, the same folks that are doing DevOps Days are putting that on. Um, today, I'm the Director of Cloud Operations at Contrast Security. I know I'm not supposed to say a whole lot of things, so I'll just mention that we're buzzword compliant. And um, you should go check us out. There we go. All right. But what I want you guys to understand most about me is this. For all the fun that I'm going to make of you, and all the fun that you should make of me, I truly believe that security matters. And that application security matters most of all, because port 443 is the hole in your firewall, and I'm going to get all of your database. See what I did there? All of your database are belong to me. <laughs> the one thing I want you to remember about history is that long before we called it DevOps, long before we were the magical unicorns, there was QA. And QA was already thinking this, and QA was already doing this. Okay? If you're asking yourself, how do I automate a thing? What should I do? Who should I do it with? And you've got QA people in your house, but you don't have DevOps people in your house, or the DevOps people are annoying like me, go talk to the QA folks. That's the root. Okay? So, that history of DevOps I was talking about. DevOps actually started with two dudes, Andrew Clay Schaefer, 
Patrick Dubois, they got together at Velocity, they were the only two that showed up for this open space, and they said, what if we could run operations teams in an agile fashion? And I mean, think about that. Where the stories are made up and the points don't matter. I mean, who wouldn't want in on that action, right? That one will take 42. Anyone see what I did there? <laughs> From 2010 to 2012, infrastructure is code, all right? You can call it dev puppet ops or dev IAC ops or whatever. I was a chef guy myself. But ultimately, Puppet State of the DevOps report, which they still do every year, is worth reading. If you want to understand DevOps and where DevOps is today, I would say that's the seminal article to go and find. And go back and read through the histories a bit. Chef had an incredible community for years. I was actually in IRC, this is back in the day when IRC was still a thing, um, with a chef engineer at 3 o'clock in the morning. We were actually hunting down something that we'd figured out was a bug. Now that's amazing in and of itself because at the time, I was the known idiot in IRC asking for help. And they were still taking it seriously. Like, and it actually was a bug. While we were in there, a self-proclaimed little old lady asked for cooking advice in the chef channel. <laughs> and you know what we did? We answered her questions while we were debugging the chef stuff. <laughs> you can't make this up, people. And you can find, go, I, somebody can go search that in the IRC logs. That would have been circa 2012. So there you go. All right. <laughs> Um, but consider this, all right? Puppet wasn't the original, and actually CF Engine really wasn't either. Back in 2001, a tiny little company called Blade Logic, which was founded by a guy named Dev Itziaria, was founded. And it's configuration management. And in 2008, before DevOps was even born, 2009, they were sold to BMC for $800 million. Dev's brother lives uh, here in town. He's the uh, CTO of Casasa. So hopefully uh, he'll have the same success there. All right, what's the point? What I want you to understand here is this. We as engineers in our meritocracy, we often fight over priority. I had that idea first. I am the baddest engineer ever. No, it's not who had the idea first. It's who had the best idea. Puppet did not solve configuration management. Puppet made configuration management a problem that could be reasoned about by mere mortals. Now that's important to me because I can do a magic trick. I can walk out of this room and magically the average IQ will increase. Okay? I need stuff from mere mortals. Now, that's going to be a pattern. From about 2011 to 2015, CICD became the thing. Problem one, CICD is not one thing. It is two things. The CI problem is solved. Nobody talks about it anymore. Except those people who are getting rid of that Jenkins server finally. Because <laughs> it does all the things, right? Build as code came along and it became the reason that Jenkins fell. Jenkins couldn't keep up. What is build as code? It's that YAML file that sits right there in your repo that tells whatever build system, Travis CI, Circle CI, Shippable, whatever, that it's going off to and it's building the thing based on the same pull request, the same workflow, the same reviews, the same everything that the developer does. And that describes how the code gets packaged and sent to wherever it's going next, whether that's a QA environment. Am I getting a lot of feedback? I can, I can stop that. Because y'all can still hear me, right? I'll adjust it back there. Okay. Sorry. The recording won't work if I do that. <laughs> All right. So, again, what I want to point out, though, is Martin Fowler. How many of you all know that name? Yeah, that guy's famous, right? Martin Fowler is agile. Martin Fowler is extreme programming. Martin Fowler is continuous integration. Cruise control, 2001, ThoughtWorks. Why is CI a solved problem? Because we've been working on it for nearly 15 years before it was solved. We had time to do it. So consider that as you're asking yourself, how do we solve all the securities? We haven't had time yet. But again, I want you to notice that something as code. In, his, in the last talk, Jeff, um, Jeff Williams, my boss, said um, security is code. It's a thing, right? It, no, but it should be. I'll make, that, um, I'll make that argument a little more cogent here in a minute. Okay? But in order to practice the advantages of Agile, which is to say, 
DevOps really isn't all the developers and all the operations people magically getting together and having wonderful fluffy bunnies and rainbows. No, that's not DevOps. DevOps was a bunch of grouchy old bastards like me sitting down and saying, those developers have a really good life and we're suffering from PTSD over here. <laughs> now you laugh, but I do want to point out, suicide in operations is a thing, okay? There is two or three times a year, I get a phone call and I go talk somebody off the ledge in Austin, Texas. Things needed to change. Now, I want you to reflect on yourselves as security operations people. You are also first responders. You are also subject to PTSD. You need a better and more humane to work as well. And let's face it, the dude that rolls in in his flip-flops at 10 o'clock, shits some code, throws it over the wall, and leaves it for, that's the life we want, right? <laughs> Sorry, Logan. <laughs> all right. We need our work to look more like developer work because ultimately, really, all joking aside, the developers have a great workflow, a powerful workflow. They have automated checks. They have human checks. And they produce good stuff. Is it good enough? No. Is it better than what we're doing now? Yes. Then came along Docker, 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 Docker. Hey, you have a problem? Rub some Docker on it, it'll go away, right? Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> what was really cool about Docker is this. Again, in 1999, remember that century? FreeBSD came out with the idea of jails. That's the original container. 1999, okay? Solaris Zones came out in 2005, and today, Zones, although Solaris has lost a lot of its traction, Zones are still the most fully featured container technology in the world. And Docker containers, well, they still kind of suck. So why Docker? Because of the developer workflow. Think about this. The developer declares all of their dependencies, including the infrastructure. And when it gets to the end of the build pipeline, it's not a jar file or a war file or some ball of PHP that you don't know what to do with. It's an actual infrastructure artifact that can be deployed, well, if you listen to Docker's marketing, anywhere. <laughs> they forget to tell you you need a Docker daemon, right? But, you know, hey, that's just assumed. All right. So developers are actually producing infrastructure as an artifact. That's amazing. And the actual uptick in Docker adoption was not anything to do with production operations. That came a lot later. The original uh, 2015, why is everybody adopting Docker? Was build parallelization. So I'll give you an example of what that can do. Because as we inject more automated tests from security into the build pipeline, we need to be able to make sure that we can maintain the speed of building those things. So in contrast right now, we have this Java agent that Jeff was talking about. And here's the thing. Every time we build that Java agent, when somebody puts that into the build pipeline, 900 containers spin up to run all the test suites we need to run to make sure that all the frameworks and all the things and promises that we make are actually true. Now, what did that look like before Docker? Well, there's a guy named Ian who used to uh, come to the Docker meetup, and he was explaining that at BMC, he had a thousand machines, like racks and racks of machines. Each one of those was a build node, and it was super cool, right? I mean, he could do all kinds of wicked cool things. Think of the expense. When Ian went and did the R&D to actually do that in Docker, he needed one rack of 10 machines ever. So, 1,000 machines to 10 machines. And things were going just as fast. Now, could he just give back the other 990 machines? Yeah, sure. Or he could go find other things to build even faster, to create faster feedback loops, and so forth and so on. So, again, Docker made a difference in several different places. Containerization. And along comes Kubernetes. Now, if you're holding a conference or you're having a meetup and attendance is flagging, just make sure the next one says Kubernetes and your attendance will double. <laughs> of course, the people that show up, you won't understand them, but hey, you know. All right, so Kubernetes is orchestration as code. Ultimately, there's a YAML file you can drop in there that's just a Helm, it's called a Helm chart. You, you plug in the Helm chart and it goes, oh, cool, there are the images, now there are the containers, and it's all HA, and magic fluffy run bunnies and rainbows. Yeah, it's a lot harder than that, I'm lying to you. All right, <clears throat> but again, there's that thing as code. And then there's that time I got kind of sick to my stomach over the ever-growing attack services of abstractions that are happening here. And 
In the Texas Scalability Summit back in September here in town, Chris Nova showed that if you don't set, def if you don't change default Kubernetes settings, it's really easy to hack the kernel from any container, from any C group. Okay, Kubernetes creates its own set of security problems. But think about it. Kubernetes is really an artifact of about 2016. It's only three years old. It needs time to develop and mature. And we, the people in this room, need to help ensure that it's actually secure. Because that's what y'all's skill set is, and that's the skill set we need in our DevOps echo chamber. But again, I want you to notice a pattern of standardization here. Agile, we're standardizing our work practices. Configuration management, we're standardizing server builds. This gets really interesting in a moment. CI, CD, we're standardizing builds and kind of deploys. CD is definitely not a solved problem. Most people don't even understand what it means to commit to trunk. And so we still have that battle to fight. Docker was simplifying standard infrastructure <laughs> to the point of actually eliminating configuration management. It didn't just make it easier. It obviated the need for the configuration management at all. And that was before Chef could even exit, poor Chef. So, and then finally, Kubernetes is standardization of orchestration. Orchestration is, by math proof, an NP incomplete problem. And yet, Kubernetes has done so much to standardize it that if you're willing to behave based on its assumptions, you can benefit from standardization. And then along came serverless. <laughs> One million dollars. Um, so as a consultant um, for my last two years, I saw significant companies in the PCI, HIPAA, and FERPA spaces, that's finance, healthcare, and education, running entire serverless topologies. Like, their application was 400 Lambda functions in AWS, okay? There was no, there really was no server. And if it's serverless, then it must be code. And if it's all code, then AppSec must play a critical role in securing it. And yet nobody can answer the question, how do I secure a serverless function? James Wickett can, but he's not here this week. So, <clears throat> again, I want you to notice this time, not the pattern of standardization, but the pattern of elimination. Agile eliminated bespoke work processes and gave us ways to talk about work without having to reinvent the wheel in every conversation. Configuration management eliminated the bespoke infrastructure. CICD eliminated the need for bespoke testing, the need for it. Docker eliminated configuration management. Kubernetes hasn't actually been around long enough to eliminate anything yet except a lot of the toil around orchestrating an application, if, again, you're willing to buy into the assumptions that it makes. And serverless, well, it eliminates infrastructure. So I guess I'll be looking for a job if anyone's hiring, <laughs> allegedly. Um, so, thus, containers and configuration management, if serverless reaches its potential, will be eliminated. Anybody have this picture in their head of that snake eating its own tail? <laughs> right? DevOps is self-consuming because one of the primary tenets of a DevOps practice, not the tooling, not the devs and ops playing together in harmony, but the actual practice of DevOps is we seek to eliminate work from the system that does not need to be done. Now, you might think, yeah, go DevOps. That's a brilliant thing. No, Fowler thought of it back in the Agile days, you know, in the 90s. So, and I'll show you here in just a moment. All right. But you have a problem. You're Gandalf saying, that code shall not pass. Right? <laughs> um, right now, when I deal with security people, they value the bespoke. They're that hoodie person that Tanya was talking about yesterday. They're that... I did all the things and I twisted all these buttons and bad things happened. Ooh, right? Manage me through fear. You know what? I'm not afraid. You know why? The business doesn't care. The people writing my paycheck, they don't care. You slow them down, you're in the way, you get run over. All right. I figured that out as that angry sysop and, and DBA. And I learned over time how to deliver value. And it took me a long time because I'm dense and I'm stupid. None of you all strike me as dense or stupid. Remember, you're, you're, it's okay to laugh at me. <laughs> so none of y'all strike me as either dense or stupid. So maybe I can get it from 10 years of learning from me down to, you know, well, 10 minutes of learning to you. I don't know. But <clears throat> you can do this. Remember, don't be chicken little. And remember that you point out the problem and you don't have a viable solution. All you've done is make people worry. 
and giving them no way to stop worrying. That's a problem that you created and not brought a solution for. So I see you all in most ways as a pre-DevOps op. I see you as that angry me 10 years ago. So DBA, don't touch my database. Sysadmin, no, you can't have access to that because, well, you might be able to take my job away from me. Don't move my cheese. Don't. don't. <laughs> A high value on bespoke knowledge and behavior. I can model things to fifth normal form. Raise your hand if you even know what relational modeling in fifth normal form means. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you all later. <laughs> a low value on the standardization of practices, because anything that was standardized meant they didn't need me anymore. And that's, that, that made me less important. And except that in many ways, here's the thing. I look at you as a form of quality assurance with one problem. Shannon Leitz, who's going to talk later today, she, met, she taught me this back in 2015 when we were at a conference together. I said, Shannon, you're just QA. Why are you special? You're not special. Because if you're special, you can't take advantage of all the things that we're doing to make your life easier. And she said, you know, Boyd, you're right. A lot of what we do is quality assurance, security assurance, except for one thing. When you all miss, really bad things happen, and CEOs end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and that's not good, right? There's real worry in this. So it's not that you have a job like QA. It's that you have a harder job than QA. And we, on our side of things, on the DevOps unicorn ride, we need to acknowledge that, OK? You're playing for much higher stakes than we were. QA finds a thing, and it gets fixed. I would argue that that's because there was a standard way that was known that it should behave and that it could be fixed. In your security example, where you have to write a risk assessment, that means that some expert had to evaluate it. And when you put a human in the loop, the loop slows down dramatically. And so the standardization of work is actually one of the things that I believe that needs to come out of you all sitting here today. How do I take as much of the work as possible, the simple stuff, and shove it away so that I can get to the important stuff where we actually do need a risk assessment? So, and I'll, uh, I'll color in the, I'll color in the uh, lines there in a little bit. Thank you. And like Chip just did, yell at me whenever you want, please. Is there an extra mic we could give to somebody so that I don't have to repeat the questions? No? Oh, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Turns out. Chip, did you just volunteer to do this? Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. So if you subscribe to the truth that security is the impediment to business, then there is a great opportunity. Now, before you think to yourself, hey, wow, that's really cool, and you know, go Boyd. That's not me. That's a guy named Eliyahu Goldrad, who wrote a book called The Goal. Okay? These are the five focusing steps of the theory of constraints, which revolutionized manufacturing in the world. Okay? So this is not Boyd BS. This is, well, it's Ellie BS, but um, it's not BS. Find the constraint. Maybe that's you guys. Y'all are slowing us down right now. But you're doing important work. So we need to make sure you're in the loop. How do we do that so you can deliver business value? Optimize the constraint. This is where I'm talking about removing the toil of security into automation. Subordinate all work to the system. Once you guys have come through the first two, then we can make the cadence of producing software match security's ability to secure software. And thus, we will end up with more secure software. Elevate the constraint. Maybe we need a second security person. Maybe we need to, um, I don't know, move QA ahead of security so you all aren't testing bad code. We don't want the page to be broken before somebody's security eyes get on it, right? And then finally, once you've done that, you're not done. And this is where job security happens. Do it again. So if you just look at your shampoo bottle tonight when you're taking a shower, lather, rinse, repeat. Who's that guy? OK, ready? Puns. How do you know when you have Sisyphus? I mean, <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> all right. First, turn toil into code. Again, you've heard me say it over and over again. If it's done a third time, it should be automated before the fourth. Why? Automated security tests in the build pipeline are key. All right? QA's already been there, and they have paved the way for you. DevOps has made the, the thing happen. Don't reinvent the wheel. Come join the party. It's in the, and the party's in the build pipeline. We're not hiding from you. Just come looking for us. 
<laughs> it's usually where you'll see a big TV flashing red saying, Logan broke the build, Logan broke the build. <laughs> So, in all seriousness, Agile says to value, uh, I'm sorry, Agile, has, um, <laughs> Agile says it has, it values individual actions, I'm sorry, individuals and interactions over process and tools. I should know that off the top of my head. So I ask you, should we value working automated security tests over manual processes and procedures? I think we can all agree to that, but how many of you have that sick little feeling in your stomach like your job's gonna go away? Because that's what I had 10 years ago as a sysop and a DBA, as, as I was watching, as I was actually automating my job away. But here's a, here's a rule my dad told me. You know what the reward for a job well done is? Another job, yeah. So remember, while we value automation more, we, there is still important value to manual testing. For example, exploratory testing. You can, you can put that term on QA and you can put that term on security. So in, and in DevOps, what we learned is automate all the things. That's what we value most. But first, know what you're automating. That's why I said the third time, then automate it. Because if you've done it three times, you should have mastered it as a manual process. Maybe you know there are 122 steps that you need to automate. But the first time you did it, you thought there were only 22 steps, right? OK, so gain mastery, then automate. What does it mean to automate security checks? That's a rhetorical question. I don't know. That's the stuff that's in your head that is not in my head because I'm a DevOp, I'm not a security. How do we gain assurance faster and better? Faster and better. Remember, you can go fast and run into a wall. You didn't really accomplish much there unless you were trying to, you know, I don't know, some sort of chaos experiment. But um, so better matters. Joining the Agile release train. <laughs> My VP of engineering talks about this all the time. He's like, don't stop the release train. I'm like, dude, will puppies die? He's like, no, but don't stop the release train. <laughs> all right. So Agile says it values responding to change over following a plan. So I ask you, should we value our ability to quickly assure minimum viable security over a set of checks that happen after the code is complete? And I think minimum viable here is what's really, really important. Remember that while we're ensuring security during development is more important, there is still value to testing after the code has gone live. For example, a red team exercise. Um, the security folks at Contrast just came to me and said, we wanna, run a red, we wanna run a pen test on you. I'm like, okay, when can we schedule it? I'm like, how about now? And they're, they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm not gonna open ports for you. Yeah, hey, attacker, here you go, come and attack me. No. If you want to get in, get in. And don't tell me you're doing it. Tell me when you got in. We'll fix that, and we'll work with you to do it. Right? OK, cool. I sure hope they don't crash the database, but we'll fix that too. All right. In DevOps, here's what we learned. Our ability to prevent mistakes early saves time, talent, and treasure. You hear the business value in that last word? We're beginning to matter. That's what we value most. We also value most our ability to rapidly fix things in production. Which is to say, if a release goes out and something is broken, we can put a release out minutes later if we need to because we trust our build pipeline. We trust all that automation that we've done. Our ability to identify production issues, the vulnerabilities, is still an obligation. And we still know this is valuable. So again, I want to say, that wizard, that hoodie guy that Tanya was talking about, that person is still super valuable. And when you think about it, how would we know what to automate if hoodie guy isn't there. Hoodie guy is telling us what to automate. <clears throat> so, what could you, um, and what if you could actually fix a vulnerability you know, within an hour of finding it? Right? That's a superpower. Okay, we found out that we made a mistake. Great. It's going to take six weeks to fix it. Yeah. Hey, hackers, hold off for a little while, right? <laughs> Do you remember when, um, what was it, uh, the snake one for the hypervisor? Uh, was it Viper? Um, Viper dropped back in 2015. Every cloud company you talk to, they, it's customer service just stopped. Nobody was saying anything, right? And it's like, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen. And sure enough, they're like, KVM, is a, you're able to like take over entire data centers because KVM. Great, right? They had to hide that because they couldn't fix it quickly. All right. So fighting forward and fighting forward fast and with assurance because our build pipeline has those security tests in it. That's what matters. Now, 
This one's really esoteric. If you've been to all the DevOps talks, if you go to DevOps days and whatnot, you're not going to hear this except if you're out on the fringes where the Illuminati hang out. Safety culture. Safety culture is where human lives are at risk. I'm out on a drilling rig and I put my finger here to help put something into place and I nearly lose my finger. Okay? There were plenty of people that lost their finger before I nearly lost my finger because safety measures were put in place. That's safety culture. In, <coughs> excuse me, in tech, this really came about at AWS with a guy named Jesse Robbins. He was one of the original founders of Chef. He would go around in AWS data centers and just unplug things. Shannon Leitz, again, who's talking later, she does the same thing at uh, Intuit during tax season. All right? <laughs> yeah. She should be able to do that, right? We should have self-healing systems. So you hear this notion of generative culture, and it's often attached to the notion of agile. Oh, if you have a generative culture, then people have trust, and they, they'll admit their mistakes, and wh whatever. If you have a generative culture, you can say, yo, man, I screwed up, and I need help figuring this out. Ma'am, can you help me figure it out, please? That has power. One, it tells the other person that you're a human. And two, it gives them the permission to say, you know, I make mistakes too, so maybe we need to rope in this other person because I only have this much knowledge. Because when it comes to security, fake it until you make it can be a little, um, well, scary. So Agile has four values in its manifesto, but it has 12 principles, and this is the 11th one. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. That's where you get to generative culture. Culture is actually a pillar of DevOps. Culture, automation, lean thinking, measurements, and sharing. Those are the five pillars of DevOps. So, safety culture is the basis for today's common Agile ceremonies. In other words, safety culture was around long before Agile and DevOps. So if you want to look into maybe some of the things that are going to be more important as security comes into the DevOps chamber, I think this is where to start because this is where the really high stakes stuff is happening. And we haven't explored it yet either. And I wonder if that's why security is only now becoming the DevSecOps movement. <clears throat> yeah, everyone's seen the button, you know, safety, it's everybody's concern. But remember, when you blame a person, they're gonna hide their mistake. When you make it safe to talk about mistakes, you make it safe to learn. This is that generative culture at the top of the hierarchy. And when learning happens, maturity of the system improves. And ultimately, we're not trying to improve our department. We're not trying to move forward our own agenda. We're trying to make the entire system operate optimally. What's the goal of any company? To make money. Right. We need to empower teams and we need to hold them accountable to their learning. I have two college kids working for me on my operations team right now. That's it. And when I got to contrast in May, the first thing I said to them after watching them operate for two weeks is, y'all are not effing up enough. Bill fast and fail off. Yeah, so yeah, um, move fast, break things, Facebook. What I told them actually is this though, it's okay to break something. What's not okay is to do it the same way twice. If you're gonna screw up, do it in a new and novel way. <laughs> All right. Simplicity. I can't stress this enough. It's come up in nearly every talk I've been in today. Agile principle number 10. Simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. This is essential. Remember, this is from back in early, like, 2000, okay? And we're talking about, like, oh, remove work from the system like it's some sort of new thing. No, Goldrat was from the 80s, and he was talking about removing unnecessary work from the system. Deming was from the 50s. <laughs> Did you all hear what Jason said? Deming, D-E-M-I-N-G, I have a reference to him later. It was from the 50s, yes, okay? So what's taken us so bloody long, 60 years? I thought we were smart people, yes, sir. How long did it take for Henry Ford and the assembly line to actually take off? I see similarities here. So I think it took him about 15 years and he had to build his own to prove that it worked because everyone was resisting change to that bespoke, make the wagon really pretty uh, type of thing. I think it was 15 years, but I'm not certain on that. He only invented the mechanized assembly line. Assembly line before That's, yep. Right, assembly line and standardization was a big part of that. Do you remember the quote? You can have it any color. So long as it's black. Yeah. So there you go, right? <laughs> All right, so let's view this simplicity thing from the perspective of the lean movement. One must strive to remove work from the system. 
That's lean is a, an, out, an outcropping of the theory of constraints by Goldratt. In Gene Kim's The Phoenix Project, uh, the first way is to remove unnecessary work in, an order, in order to maximize the throughput of the entire system. And this comes in turn from the work Deming and Goldratt did. There you go. Thanks. So you can read about the three ways here, or you can pick up the book The Phoenix Project. Next, anyone um, familiar with the story of Alexander and the Gordian Knot? Okay, Alexander the Great conquered the world, such as it was known at the time, right? Talk to the Chinese, I think they'd have a different view of that, but hey. All right. The Gordian Knot was this thing that scholars were working on at the Library of Alexandria. They were trying to unravel this knot, and it was, the story was that whomever could unravel the knot would rule the world. So Alexander comes into the library one day, he looks at the knot, he looks at all the nerds, and he chops the knot in half thus unraveling it and going on to conquer the world. This is a true story, at least in so much as the, you know, something that's 3,000 years old can be true. Um, and I kind of think he was the uh, world's first hacker. <laughs> All puns intended. <clears throat> so, this is me. Complex is what smart people do, but simple is what smart people who are responsible for the outcomes do. Okay? Please keep that in mind. If you have a complex solution, the first thing you should do is seek to simplify it. But we're going to lose our jobs. There we go. We're all leaving. Fact. Jobs that create value will always replace jobs that have business value. That's not an agile principle. This was terrifying in the early days of DevOps. I've been running Austin DevOps for seven years. In the first year, we had every kind of sysadmin coming and going, my job's going to go away. Oh, my God. And you know what? It did. The job of the sysadmin has largely gone away. And it was replaced by a job called DevOps engineer. Again, what the fuck is that? Um, and, but I'll take it because it came with a 100% pay raise. <laughs> yeah, winning. All right. While there are still sysadmins in the world, and they are still really valuable, there are still people running the hardware that is the cloud. Um, and infrastructure jobs, again, those same people, we value those innovating on business value far, far more. Be one of those. So in DevOps, what we've learned is the following. It's only a matter of finding the right place to practice your craft. If you can turn security into code, you will become more valuable. If you're thinking about how to turn security into code, if you're thinking about how to enable people to turn security into code, you'll be winning. That place is at the point of creation and not after creation happens, i.e., if it ain't measured in the build pipeline, you're slowing things down and you're not delivering value. Resistance is futile. DevSecOps was coined by Shannon back in 2015. She was, at the time, at DevSecOps on Twitter. And remember that there are plenty of well-paid COBOL programmers in the world. You're safe. <laughs> and sysadmins, too. Just, just saying. All right. So, sorry, Alessia. <laughs> Marketing versus reality. This is what marketing tells you DevOps is, right? Oh, it's simple, and it's dev, and it's ops, and it's purple, and it's pretty, you know, hug. What DevOps really is is messy, OK? Because it involves people. That was not DevOps, because there are not clearly two defined and distinct roles. The implicit idea that they just fit together is false. Simplicity is implicit, but complexity is the reality. And anyone can do it. No, anyone can't do it. Because if everyone could do it, I wouldn't have got that 100% pay raise. <laughs> just saying. Hashtag, that should be a hashtag, right? Hashtag just saying for all you like, young people. All right. Um, <laughs> DevOps. It represents the entire system, right? It's all the things. And it comes assembly required. Because your organization and your system look different than other people's organizations and systems. It's beautifully simple at a glance and devilishly difficult to do right. Because it requires, as Chip pointed out, with those five focusing steps, that repeat. You don't just do it. You are constantly practicing the thoughts of DevOps. So how do you get involved? What can you do? This is how you act now. You can join the DevSecOps movement. I actually think that's oxymoronic. Okay? I love that the security gear has a lock on it and can't turn. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Veritas. I enjoyed, the, I enjoyed that. All right. Um, so consider joining forces with an existing movement. DevOps has been around for 10 years and has been wildly successful. It is the way that many businesses are saying, this is how we get things done. 
Consider that in the same platform is one that you can learn from. And Jeebers, again, the sick gear. <laughs> and what were they thinking? All right, so here's what I'd like you to do. Most of you are from Austin. Here's a local thing that you can do. Please take out your phones and take a picture of this. And the slides will be on, but I'd like you to get involved sooner rather than later. I run Austin DevOps. We are a DevOps community of nearly 3,000 people here in Austin. On a monthly basis, 50 to 120 people will show up at a meetup to discuss some DevOps topic. Join my meetup and bring your content. Please ask to speak. I would love to bring security content. So when we get 100 people to come out on a month, security is usually not Kubernetes anymore. Security. You're it. We need you. Cloud Austin is, in my opinion, the best meetup in town. It's run by Ernest Muller and the guys who are doing Dev DevSecOps days. Um, it's amazing. Same thing. They want your security content. They need your security content. We want you in our echo chamber so the voice of security is bouncing around in there with the voice of Kubernetes. DevSecOps days is happening. Uh, there's the link. Uh, DevOps days Austin will happen May 4th and 5th at the Westin. And don't forget your own community. As you go out to these new communities, and I am putting this on you, when you come to my meetup, tell people about the OWASP meetup. Tell them what's going to happen. Make personal invitations. Hey, Chip, would you come to my meetup? I'd sure appreciate it. That matters. Because some of the DevOps people will come and they'll bring ideas into your community. And eventually we will become one community, making the entire system better. Anybody know this movie? Yeah, I cried. OK. So <laughs> I have one feeling, and that found it. Um, so how do you pay it forward? I'm inviting you in, and I'm inviting you to benefit from all that we have done over the last 10 years. If you're wired like any operations person, and I know that you are, you're thinking, well, I can't, how do I take on the obligation of all that and not give something back? It's pretty easy, really. <clears throat> you're not going to be the last one in. If you look way out on the horizon of DevOps right now, there's Dev Chaos Ops. There's Dev Observability Ops. And somebody's like, oh, well, observability and monitoring, they're the same thing. No, they're not. And observability matters. But we don't know how and why yet. We just know that we're talking about it. But it's out there on the horizon. And as security matures over the next couple of years, if, pattern, if the pattern holds, security will become a mature DevOps thing and a voice in the echo chamber. And maybe observability will come next. And when you think about it, observability, security. Hmm, that's a good thing. <clears throat> Dev safety ops, as I mentioned, that sort of fringe talk for the last 10 years around safety culture. Will you help? Um, you will help those new movements make their way into the echo chamber and make the entire system better for your own presence there. Okay? DevOps isn't awesome because I'm there. Uh, in fact, you guys should kick me out. I'd probably get better a lot faster. All right? So, with that, Outstanding. I have a question. How many of you have read The Phoenix Project? Great. Put your hands down. How many of you have not read The Phoenix Project? Why haven't you read The Phoenix Project? Yeah. Somebody wrote a book about your fucking life? And why haven't you read it? It's a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Tria, Tria, said she, Tria said she'd hurt me. I've got five more. Okay. <laughs> This is, this is what happens when you throw books at nerds, right? <laughs> uh, all right, sorry. Now, hold on. Don't leave. I got a money back guarantee here. I am not the author of the Phoenix Project by any stretch of the imagination. If you got one of those from me, and if you just go and buy one yourself, and I have wasted your time, you come to Austin DevOps. You tell me I wasted your time. And when you go to beer ops with us that night, usually about 30 of us go over to Easy Tiger when the meetup's over. You can sit down across from me, and I will buy you dinner, and you can explain to me why I wasted your time. OK? I have given this guarantee to over 10,000 people. 10,000. I've never done it in a security conference, and man, I'm wondering how much money I'm going to be out. Because <laughs> y'all are picky. <laughs> so, but it is a guarantee. And it's on film, and you can hold me to it. All right? I really appreciate your time. If there are any questions, uh, you're welcome to, I mean, I guess we have, well, you know what? Lunch has started. Screw that. I'll go over to the contrast booth. I'll stand there, and you can come shout at me about what a jerk I am. Have a great day.